Hello, sophomores. This week we are working a little bit with poetry. This is one of the po poems from your packet. Um, it's found on page two. Um, and this is Ode to My Socks by Pablo Neruda. So if you don't already have that out in front of you, take a second, flip to it. Um, I want us to just kind of briefly look through it um, and talk through it, make sure we understand everything going on with the poem. I also have underneath this um, Langston Hughes' Mother to Son. Um, and we're going to look through that very quickly as well and kind of just get an idea, um, a little bit more of poetic structure um, and how poems work. <clears throat> now, one of the things that I said in the packet is that an ode um, is a celebratory poem. And as you've, you had to write about that um, during the, there we go, um, during your reading. So one of the first things that I think you'll notice is the, uh, the fact that it does not rhyme. So when we're looking for rhyme scheme, we always look to the end of the lines. And we start with the first line of the poem. And whatever that sound is, in this case, me, the E sound at the end, gets an A. And that is the A sound um, for this poem. And socks and me very clearly do not rhyme. So then socks would get a B. Now, normally I would put it right here, but just to make sure that it's very easy for us to see and we can see them all together, I'm going to pop it right there. So, and then herself would be C, hands is D, rabbits is E, and so on and so forth. Uh, and if for some reason you go all the way through the alphabet, which doesn't happen in a ton of poetry, but does occasionally happen, then you would come back and you would put in A, A, B, B. Um, if for some reason you made it all the way through, and then you go all the way back down to Z again. Um, but there's 26 letters in the alphabet. Most poems don't have 26 different sounds just because they're not long enough. You'll also notice the way that this is set up in that there are three distinct sections of a poem here. Each one of these sections, so here through here, we have a term for that. Normally, um, in a essay, you would call that a paragraph or in a book. Here, just like in music, we call it a stanza. And a stanza <coughs> is basically is basically just that in poetry. It's basically taking the place of your paragraphs. You will also notice that. Neruda does actually have complete sentences in this poem. So we actually have our first sentence right here. Um, and the thing with the line breaks is that you don't have to make a whole sentence be a whole line. He chooses to break here where he says, Maru Mori brought me a pair of socks. By making you skip the line, he slows that down and really puts emphasis on the four words, a pair of socks. And one of the things I asked you to do is think about why Neruda celebrates these socks. And I think as we look through the poem more, we'll kind of understand that, especially if we come all the way back to the end. The moral of my ode is this. Beauty is twice beauty, and what is good is doubly good when it is a matter of two socks made of wool in winter. And I think for us, especially now and living in America, um, we sometimes don't think of socks as very important things. They go on your feet and you forget about them. For a lot of people in a lot of more remote climates, more forested uh, climates, a pair of socks is a big deal. It's what keeps your feet warm. It's what keeps you um, from being miserable in the winter. And I mean, that, that kind of stuff matters. Staying warm is important. So <clears throat> if I'm doing 
um, a breakdown of this poem and I have to write about it. And somebody says, I need to write about the first stanza. This is where I'm going. Now, remember you, so you would refer to a poem by stanzas and then by lines. Some poems will have like every five lines will have a number five. So that would be right here with two socks as, uh, as soft as rabbits. Um, and sometimes they're broken out that way. Um, oftentimes, if you're ever having to answer stuff, they'll say, now in stanza one, look at this. Um, so if I were to create a test question off of this, I would go right down here to stanza number three. Because I think this is the, uh, this is the stanza that ties the whole poem together. And really makes it have that ode quality to it. Um, and that would be where I would tell you um, to read that stanza and talk about why Neruda would um, end this way. And I think that the end point here is to have a nice, um, a nice good finish um, and really turn it into an ode. Because the moral of my ode is this. He actually says it's an ode. Um, if we hadn't figured it out already. Um, the other thing too that I do want to point out is that right here where there's them and them, technically speaking, and I, I mean this truly only technically, this counts as a rhyme, technically. Um, so these would have the same letter next to them. Um, in fact, it would actually be F from all the way up here with this them. We would actually have F and F down here because even though it's many, many, many lines later, it's still the same sound. Them, them, F, F and F. Um, so that was really what I kind of wanted to show you with that. Um, there are other v formats of this poem where it's basically just all one big continuous line. Um, we're actually going to look at that a little bit more with Langston Hughes, which we're going to switch to very quickly right now. So this is Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. Obviously, this is a much, much shorter poem. And so some of the things we were just talking about with Neruda's Ode to My Socks um, are magnified here. And now Hughes in Mother to Son, this is all one stanza. So if we're going to refer to parts of the poem, we can't refer to stanzas. This is where we'll refer to lines. So if there is a specific line we wanted to reference or a range of lines, we'd say in lines five through six or five through eight, um, we would say that would be how we would reference whatever it is. Um, that way you don't have to continuously quote the poem. Uh, now you should still quote poetry much like you'll quote a, um, a t uh, an article, a book, because the poem still has the substance. It's still there. And sometimes um, when you're quoting it, you want to make sure to have the same impact rather than just kind of reference it and go lines one through five doesn't have the same impact as, well, son, I'll tell you. Life for me ain't been no crystal stare. So when you have that written out, it has different impact. The other thing that I'll point out as well is that Hughes uses a lot more punctuation in his poet poetry, specifically at the end of his lines. If you looked at Neruda's, most of his po most of his poem an ode to my socks stops at the end of the line. There's no punctuation there. You will read this punctuation like stare here, just like you would read in a sentence. So you would still stop and you would have a longer pause. Well, son, I'll tell you life for me. Ain't been no crystal stare. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor bare. Now that hyphen takes, takes the place and makes you read faster. And I think that 
when Hughes chooses to put this hyphen here and make you transition from floor to bear very, very quickly, I think it's even more important that bear is down here on its own line. So think about what that does for you visually. Remember bear meaning not having much or being, um, I guess, naked. If you have a bare floor, there's no actual floorboards or there's no carpet. It's just floor and it's unfinished and it's kind of ugly to look at and probably not too comfortable to walk on. So why does Hughes put bear on its own? Just that one word. Think about the effect that has. Because remember, we just said carpeting, floorboards, and now we have bear on its own. And I think that that just makes the feeling of uh, the floor being bare um, hit home even harder with that word just sitting there on its own. Now, Hughes does not rhyme um, in this particular poem. And I don't think he needs to. A lot of people, when they think poetry, they think rhyme. Poetry does not have to rhyme. Um, the uh, That's kind of one of the things that students kind of forget is that the poetry that's most memorable really is some of the poetry that rhymes. That's why we sing nursery rhymes to children uh, when we um, are putting them to sleep because they remember it. Um, Ring around the rosy. Um, I'll think of another nursery rhyme. Row, row, row your boat. There we go. Um, now, one of the things Hughes does that Neruda does not do, and none of the other poets that we've read so far have done, is Hughes uses very common language. So he has this particular word right here, eyes. And most students kind of struggle with that. So I want to make sure I talk about that a little bit. This eyes, we're not used to seeing that written. Um, every now and then when people are talking, they say, eyes did that. Um, I've been doing that. And this is how Hughes has chosen to make that look on paper. Eyes been a climbing. It just means I've been climbing on. Uh, but he's using the more conversational version um, of the word, and he makes that work. Now remember, when we see this little apostrophe right here, it means we've omitted a letter or a part of the word. So that's how we have climbing, reaching, landings. There's nothing really special about uh, those words other than the fact that the G is missing. And we say that all the time. I'm going to do that instead of I'm going there or I'm, you know, things like that. And he, we don't, we're not used to seeing it on paper because oftentimes we don't write about that. We're always told, you know, write in a different way, uh, write formally, make sure everything's spelled right. And Hughes writes very conversationally as a mother would talk to her son. Nobody speaks the way they write in a formal essay. It's just weird, especially for a poem like this, where this is a mother talking to her son, trying to encourage her son to keep going. She sat there and said, now, son, there are going to be challenges and you're going to face many different economic climates and there are going to be, come on. Nobody's going to talk like that to their, to their child not unless they're like a wall street investor. And even then I don't think that would happen. She's trying to tell her son to keep going. And she, she has um, a casual air to it. This here um, kinder is just another older way of saying kinda um, people would occasionally say kinder hard instead of kinda. Um, so today, if we were writing this poem, we would write out kinda like that. Um, so those are just a few things that I wanted to go over in terms of language. We're actually going to go back to um, because I could not stop for death and uh, Annabelle Lee in our next video. And that's going to be the video where we're really going to dig in and get kind of messy with the poetry.
um, we're going to kind of pick them apart. I wanted you to kind of follow this along just so we could expose ourselves to some different um, ways of writing. Uh, now, remember, when you're reading, I do encourage you to read the poems out loud. Um, stop at your punctuation. Long pause for a period, short pause for a comma, just like when you're reading. Um, and then, of course, hyphens, you'll move on quicker than you would a comma. Um, and I think that will almost completely wrap this video up. One of the things I do want to talk about is a, the idea of coming full circle. Um, in an essay, one of the things that I've told you is that the first thing you need to do is to tell your reader what you're going to tell them, right? Um, so then then you tell them and then you tell them what you told them, right? And with that, uh, with an essay, we come full circle. We start with the 12 o'clock point on our clock and we, uh, we come all the way back around to our point, right? We say that, need an argument. Um, fish are better than chickens to keep as pets. And we start at 12 o'clock. We have all of our points. We go all the way around the circle. Oh, I broke my leg. And we get here and then our arguments like, and our closing arguments like right here, we've come back to our point where we go, and this is why you should definitely get a fish as opposed to a chicken. We've come all the way back around to our original point. Hughes does that in his poem right here. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. He comes kind of full circle. And I think that adds some impact to his poem. If you've ever heard a good public speaker talk, they have a powerful message in the beginning of their speech, and a powerful message at the end. Um, Barack Obama was very, very good at this. It's part of what made him such a good public speaker. He would always come back around to where he started. Um, and Hughes does this too, which kind of sandwiches the poem. All of this here says, life's been no crystal stair. And the important thing is that we started here and we kept going and we're still climbing right? I'm still climbing and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Think about the imagery we had up here. Tacks, splinters, boards, places with no carpet. These are not fun stairs to climb. Life's been hard for this mother. And she says, I'm still climbing. Life ain't been no crystal stair. So that's where we're going to stop here with this video. The next video will be Annabelle Lee and uh, Because I Could Not Stop for Death. We'll talk a little bit more about rhyme scheme um, in those because uh, Poe actually does use quite a bit of rhyme in Annabelle Lee. So we'll actually break that one down a little bit more in rhyme scheme. And then we will also dig into Because I Could Not Stop for Death and talk a little bit more about some of the figurative language uh, that Emily Dickens uses. Have a wonderful afternoon and I'll see you in our next video.